It's Thursday, October 21st. My name is Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel and an important update on the recent MD-87 crash near Houston, Texas in which everybody survived. The NTSB is on scene and have recovered both the cockpit voice recorder and the data recorder. Though these two recorders are badly burn damaged, they have recovered the recorders themselves. Hopefully they'll be able to recover the data within those recorders. The big news here in California is rain. I got an inch and a half here in the Blanco Lirio rain gauge, hopefully putting an end to fire season. Cal Fire, I hope we can start sending people home in the North State so they can get back to their families and be done with this season's fire season. I get to keep my house for another year. We got a lot more rain on the way. Welcome to the four seasons here in California. We've gone straight from fire season to flood season. All we need now is earthquakes and riots, and that'll be the complete four seasons here in California. Let's go inside and take a look at what additional information investigators are gonna be looking at regarding this recent MD-87 crash on takeoff. For all of you asking, why don't you clear your trees, Brownie? Well, them ain't my trees. That's on the neighbor's property. It's a little half acre postage stamp lot here. Those are not my trees. My trees are cleared off. Can't do nothing about that. A lot of great comments here in the comment section on my first initial report on this MD-87 crash. And some of you guys are way ahead of me on this and are, going, are on the correct track. This isn't a matter of speculation so much when we go through this comment section. It's more a matter of digital hangar flying, if you will, where we can all discuss the various possibilities, throw questions out there, and it reminds us all of what we need to watch out for as we operate these aircraft, because this could happen to any of us. First up, investigators are gonna to wanna to look very closely at this video of the initial takeoff of this MD-87 and what is this white puff of smoke on what appears to me to be the left engine or the number one engine on this aircraft. I can tell because the smoke is obscuring the tail cone behind that engine. Right there, one puff of smoke. Was that a compressor stall? Was that the indication of some sort of problem very early on on the takeoff roll if it was some sort of a problem why didn't the crew simply reject the takeoff right then and right there did the crew not notice that there was a problem with the number one engine a second thing investigators are going to be looking at and this comes from the comment section a lot of you folks that live or operate out of this airport have reported that this aircraft has been undergoing maintenance for a very long time What's the maintenance history on this aircraft? What's the flight test history on this aircraft after extensive maintenance was performed on this airplane? For point of clarification, I want to thank Dan Greider for bringing this up to me in our phone conversation this morning. I always talk about the different FAR parts that various aircraft operations are operated under. We always talk about part 91 being general aviation, part 135 for charter operations, and part 121 for airline operations. But what if you have an airline type aircraft and want to operate it as a private owner? Well, then you fall under this FAR part 125. Those aircraft having a seating capacity of 20 or more passengers or a maximum payload capacity of 6,000 pounds or more fall under this FAR 125, and that spells out how you are to operate and maintain and maintain your flying currency in this aircraft in the hands of a private owner. As we look at the helicopter footage of the aircraft after the crash, if you look at the burn marks behind the aircraft, it looks like the number two engine was running after the in aircraft came to a full stop, burning all of the grass back here behind the number two engine or the right hand engine so was there a problem with with the number one engine that caused it to subsequently fail it appears that it was not running by the time this came to a final resting spot but the number two engine was running and running pretty hard by the time this aircraft came to a stop and again no thrust reverser deployment on either engine 
We'll talk more about thrust reversers, rejected takeoff procedures, and flap and slat setting in the MD-87 more in a minute. Here's another view showing no burn grasp behind the number one engine. Note here is one of the landing gear sheared off right here, indicating that, of course, the gear never got up, retracted, that is. Now let's spin around and take a look at these tracks. You can see the landing gear, one of the landing gear, sheared off from the side loads. The left wing impacting these trees, breaking the fall, if you will, or absorbing some of the energy of this crash. The tire marks skipping over this road here, and a full set of tire marks left, uh, let's see, uh, that would be the right main, the left main, and the nose wheel clearly shown tracking across here. Now, what about here on the runway? Are these skid marks from a rejected takeoff or are these sliding marks from the aircraft? There's a little bit of a swerve there and it looks like those, that's hard to tell if that's braking action or sliding action. Regardless, it looks like those marks are only at the very bitter end of the runway. So was this a rejected takeoff? Did the crew get into a, take, a rejected takeoff process? Or did they just continue to try to fly this aircraft off the end of the runway? That's some of the questions that NTSB will be determining, hopefully, very soon. Via interviews with the crew and the passengers. Plus, hopefully, data from the data recorders. Now, let's talk about some other possibilities. Improper configuration for takeoff, i.e. not the correct flap slat setting, or parking brake. Let's talk a little bit about the takeoff warning system and how you set the slats and flaps on the old MD-8087 series of aircraft. Now, this is a real trip down memory lane for me. It's been years since I've flown the MD-80. I've managed to dust off an old MD-80 manual here on the internet to refresh my memory. And let's go take a look at the center console. There's a great old video from my friend Kent Wayne of Wien Air Alaska and finally American Airlines as he was wrapping up his MD-80 career, why he liked the mechanical quirkiness of the MD-80. Nearly 1.4 million views. Great video. I'll post a link. Now remember this, the old center console in the MD-80. What a mechanical, <laughs> ingenious design this, this was from McDonnell Douglas. Over here is your CG flap calculator, flap setting calculator. Here's your suitcase handles to help set the trim manually, if you will. Here's your speed brakes or spoilers, spoiler handle. Here's your throttles with your thrust reversers and your toga switches down here. Here's another backup system to the elevator trim right here. Here's the pressurization wheel. Remember dinging that with the pen when <laughs> you went into overtime on your sequence? Very mechanical. This, this little wheel would move back and forth as the outflow valve opened and closed on the aircraft. And here is the flap handle and the dial a flap setting. And, of course, the fuel shutoff switches right here. All of this is governed by a, a very effective takeoff warning system. And remember on the MD-80 on the pre-flight, you would push the throttles forward and you would test the takeoff warning system and make sure all the different systems were actuated. And then when you went to takeoff on the MD-80, the captain would quickly run the th bump the throttles up and make sure that the takeoff warning system did not activate and then quickly brought the throttles back before the engines had a chance to spool up. So this MD-80 has a good takeoff warning system if it's functional. They've had problems in the past where those circuit breakers had been pulled and the takeoff warning system did not function and some crews were did manage to take off with an improper flap setting. But this is why I 
think that they d had a proper flap setting for this takeoff. Now, when you when you go back and look at this video, it's a little bit hard to tell if the slats and flaps are set correctly for takeoff, but I believe I can tell that the leading edge slats are in the full position for this takeoff. I believe this is a proper takeoff flap configuration, but it's hard to tell from this video. Again, a lot of that aircraft burned up in the wreckage, so it's going to be hard for investigators to tell. Hopefully, it'll be on the CVR data. Or correction, the aircraft data recorder backed up by the CVR. So when you get your load closeout or your data or your numbers, so to speak, they that has the desired flap setting and the desired CG of the aircraft or the actual CG of the aircraft based on their calculations. So with this trim computer over here, you would dial in the CG and over here you dial in your flap setting and up here it gives you a longitudinal trim setting where to set your stabilizer trim to. And so this number needs to match this number. And so that's how you set up your stabilizer trim. Meantime, over here on the flaps, Takeoff extended, zero to, what was that, about 23 degrees. Anywhere in there is acceptable takeoff flap setting range. This flap control has detents at the 11 degrees and 15 degrees of flaps. However, you can manually dial in any other flap setting within that range using this dial-a-flap mechanical wheel right here. And so if your load closeout came out with a flap setting different than 11 or 15, you would dial in that flap setting, like in this case it says 23, and that would create a detent for this flap handle to drop into for your takeoff flap setting. Again, all of this is monitored by the takeoff warning system, and if you had it set incorrectly, you would get a takeoff warning as soon as you advance the throttles. Here's the laundry list of items that the takeoff warning horn will go off for. Parking brakes not set. Flap lever position does not agree with the flap setting on the takeoff condition display. Slats not extended to takeoff position. Remember the leading edge slats. When you set that thing, let's go back to that picture. Stand by. If you set flaps zero, that means the slats are extended. And if I recall correctly, that would be slats to the mid position. Refresh my memory, MD-80 guys. MD-87 guys, flaps zero is flaps mid. The next position would extend your slats all the way out, if I recall correctly. It's been a long time. Speed brake handle not in the retracted position. Stabilizer setting not in agreement with the longitudinal trim setting in the takeoff condition display. ABS fail light or ABS not armed with auto brake selector at takeoff. Spoiler lever not in the arm position with ABS armed in the auto brake selector at takeoff. So all of those things will give you a good takeoff warning. And that's why I, it would be hard for these guys to take off with an improper takeoff configuration. If, unless somehow this system was disabled, which has happened before. Here's that part in the manual where you check the takeoff warning. The captain will advance both throttles momentarily to check for a takeoff warning horn and make sure it does not go off. Here's the taxi checklist where you set your flaps and verify them via the checklist. So you should be able to hear that over the CVR and the exact position of the flaps for this takeoff. And it again explains if you're using a position other than 11 or 15 degrees to use the dial a flap indicator. It also reminds us that you're not to use flaps 13 to 15 degrees in the MD-80. On the pre-flight checklist, here's where it talks about checking the takeoff warning horn for operation by pushing the throttles up but as i recall we were required to make sure that the takeoff warning went through all the different warnings and here's what it sounded like now this blast from the past is brought to you by florida aviator here on youtube we're going to go ahead and run through all the warnings sounds and alarms on the md80 fire left engine fire left engine fire right engine fire right engine Autopilot altitude stabilizer motion stall break. Okay, now we're getting into 
the takeoff warning system that dee dee. Let me back that up again and you'll hear all the systems. Again, <laughs> sounds like one of my legs, right, Pete? No, this is what you listen for on the pre flight, uh, an initial pre flight of the first flight of the day of this aircraft. Make sure all these systems are working. So let's back that up a sec. Break. Flap. Flap. Breaks, fa flaps, slats. So she says fa flaps, so you don't confuse that with slats. Spoiler. Stabilizer. Landing gear. Spoilers, sta stabilizer trim, and landing gear. So those are some of the things, those are all the things that the takeoff warning system checks. Flat, over speed. Over speed. Remember that? So that's why I think that the likelihood of them having an improper takeoff configuration is fairly unlikely in this case, if this system was working correctly. Since the two engines are largely intact, investigators will easily be able to determine if, if and what sort of problems were going on with this number one engine or either engine. And looking at this view, I sure would like to take a quick look inside of that inlet there and make sure all those fan blades are in place. Quick review of the take, rejected takeoff procedure for the MD-80. Anything below 100 knots, you basically reject for anything, including that big puff of white smoke if the air crew was aware of it. Above 100 knots, Engine failure, unsafe configuration, unsafe, unable to fly, rejected takeoff checklist. To perform the rejected takeoff maneuver without auto brakes, close the throttles, disconnect the auto throttles, brakes apply, spoilers up and aft. Make sure that the auto spoilers come up and aft. Though without auto brakes, I think you're going to have to manually do that and reverse thrust apply. With the auto brakes, close the throttles. Reverse thrust, spoilers check deployed, they should automatically deploy. If not, you gotta manually deploy them. That's the job of the first officer to call spoilers if they do not come out. Auto braking, confirm. Remember, it's always the captain always does the rejected takeoff. So, regardless of who's flying the aircraft, the captain has to take control of the aircraft and perform the rejected takeoff. Anybody can call for a rejected takeoff, but the captain has to perform the procedure. Back to why the thrust reversers should be left in the deployed position in this wreck if they were deployed at all. If you look at the evacuation checklist on the MD-80, you, you do not close the thrust reversers on those engines. Remember, too, when you're doing... Planned evacuations or evacuations in the simulator, it's always under a controlled environment. You get the aircraft under control and you get it stopped on the runway. This is a crash right after takeoff. This is definitely an unplanned evacuation. But regardless, checking the MD-80 checklist here. After the aircraft is stopped, park and brake set, flaps 28 degrees land. That helps you slide down the wing if you need to. In this case, the aircraft was on the ground because the gear was wiped out. Spoilers retracted. Get those out of the way. Evaluate the need to evacuate and then notify everybody that you're going to evacuate. Fuel levers off. You simply just cut the fuel levers off. It's, it's not a matter of retracting the bucket, so to speak, especially in an unplanned evacuation. And then evacuate, fire handles, pull battery switch off and get out of there. So was this accident a case of a missed opportunity, a missed opportunity to do a low speed reject of this takeoff as soon as this problem with this engine was identified, if it was identified by the air crew? These are some of the things accident investigators will be looking for. Thanks again so much for your support of this channel, especially over on Patreon that make this content possible as this sort of take content is often demonetized by YouTube as unsuitable for all advertisers. Thank you for your support. See you here.